Hey guys, welcome back to Business Statistics. Uh, today we're going to be covering Chapter 4, Probability. Uh, just a note of caution, uh, Chapter 4 is, is definitely where um, the material gets a little bit harder. So I would say um, spend more time on this chapter than you would. Uh, I might be kind of giving you guys a little bit of extra time on this chapter. Um, like we might, maybe we'll take a week and a half or something. Um, but yeah, this, this chapter is going to require a lot more thought than, than, um, one, two, and three did. And there's some concepts, um, that are, uh, difficult to pick up. And a lot of the problems that we're going to look at are going to hinge on wording, um, and your attempts to kind of analyze, uh, kind of what a question is asking and and so so you're gonna see the chapter four is a little bit difficult um but yeah so spend a lot of time on it ask a bunch of questions in the discussion uh forums um don't be shy about that because i i guarantee a lot of you guys are gonna have questions here so we're gonna do our best to get through it and i'm gonna do my best to give you guys as many examples as possible and yeah all right here we go so chapter four we're gonna be um looking at um <clears throat> Section 1 and 2, which kind of introduces you to probability, sample spaces, and events. Um, chapter 3, the elementary uh, probability rules. So um, I'm going to be looking at the complement, uh, the addition rule, multiplication rule, stuff like that. Um, conditional probabilities 4, um, that's kind of when it starts to get difficult. That's kind of when the wording of problems is going to kind of trip you up. Bayes' theorem is a nightmare. I mean, Bayes' theorem is really, really, really difficult. So what we're going to do is we're going to touch on Bayes' theorem. I'm going to show you how to use the formula, and then I'll leave it up to you if you would like to use Bayes' theorem when you come up to a Bayes' theorem problem. Um, the reason I say that is because you're going to come up to a lot of these Bayes' theorem problems, and you don't actually have to use Bayes' theorem. You can use a contingency table and the other elementary rules and conditional rules of probability in order to solve um, that problem where I, I just think Bayes' theorem is very confusing and um, and yeah I just I, I just think it's a less it's less apparent than just using kind of the elementary rules so uh, I'll show you both ways to solve uh, the problem uh, that we are going to go through tonight and I'm sure you'll probably choose to not use base theorem going forward, but you have that option. And then lastly, we'll cover counting rules. So counting rules, we kind of step away from probability a little bit. And we're going to be talking about, um, I guess, the independent rule of, of counting events and then uh, the rule of combinations. All right, so without any further ado, let's get into it. 4142, probability sample spaces and events. An experiment is any process uh, of observation with an uncertain outcome. Okay, that's easy enough. The set of all possible outcomes for an experiment are called the sample space. Probability is a measure of the chance that an experimental outcome will occur when an, uh, when an experiment is carried out. And an event is a set of sample space outcomes. Um, the probability of an event is the sum of the probabilities of the sample space outcomes that correspond to the event. Okay, so we'll give you a little bit example, uh, a little bit of an example. I kind of rushed through those because I wanted to um, be able to write out uh, really how how to explain it. So one thing that we'll do is we'll talk about an experiment of rolling a die. So rolling a die is in and of itself the experiment. Okay, so so we can kind of check off, boom, that. All right. Um, the set of all possible outcomes for the experiment is called the sample space. So what are all the uh, possible outcomes of rolling rolling um, a die? So the outcomes we have are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay, so those are the, uh, so that would be considered the sample space. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Probability is a measure of the chance that an experimental outcome will occur when an experiment is carried out. Um, so, of course, we know that 
uh, the odds of rolling any one of these outcomes is equally likely. So I'll just put an arrow and we'll say probability of x is equal to one sixth. Okay. And then an event is a set of sample space outcomes. So rolling a die, uh, rolling a die is 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 the experiment. We roll an, uh, we roll a die. We are going to get one through six. But if we wanted to test the probability of an event, say I said I'll pay you five dollars if you roll higher than a four. So then uh, the event would be rolling higher than a four. So the event would be. Uh, rolling a five or six and so then it says the probability of the event is the sum of the probabilities of the sample space outcomes so then we would look at each sample space outcome so there's five and six and we'd know that the sum or we know that the probability of five occurring is one six the probability of six occurring is one six we would add those together to get the probability of the event and we would get two six or one third or in decimal terms, 0.3333333. Okay, so that's probability, sample spaces, and events in a nutshell. Um, and that's kind of the classic example, and probably the easiest example um, for me to give you. Um, but that's that's the experiment, sample space, probability, event in, in, in a nutshell. So probability. Uh, if E is a sample space outcome, then probability of uh, E denotes the probability that E will occur and these conditions need to be met. Um, this right here, all that's saying is that the probability of E needs to be between 0 and 1, okay? Such that if E can never occur, then the probability is 0. And if E is certain to occur, then the probability is 1. Okay, and then this is the other one that's important. The probabilities of a sample space, um, the probabilities of a sample space outcomes must sum to one. So for every occurrence, um, if we add all of those up, they're always going to sum to one. So if we go back here with the rolling the dice experiment, one, two, three, four, five, six, we have six different outcomes, each of them equally likely in this case, all of them one sixth of a chance or one sixth probability. We add up 1 6 plus 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 1 6 six times, and we get 1. So we know that the total probability is 1 in every single scenario. So this gets us to um, assigning probabilities to a sample space. Um, what we just talked about was an example of the classical method. Classical method is um, equally likely outcomes. Um, this is uh, this is generally going to be something that um, occurs randomly. Um, you know, like a an equal weighted die uh, flipping a coin. You know, like each side is technically or I guess theoretically uh, uh, like uh, equally likely outcome. So that's the classical method. The classical method is just assigning the number of the so there's the number number of sample space outcomes so for flipping a coin it would be two and then just dividing the total probability of one divided by that number of sample space outcomes so uh, so for a coin toss um, we know that the total probability is equal to one and then sample space outcomes equal to two and so then the probability of each outcome so heads tails probability of that so I'll just put P is going to be one divided by two or one half so that's classical long run, long run frequency um, is different um, it's when uh, we don't know the uh, either for whatever reason if we don't know the the probability of certain events or I guess certain sample space outcomes we run an experiment to determine those um, oh, excuse me and then lastly a subjective is something that we're not really going to use much of at all in this course but we did want to mention it and that's just 
using expertise or experience or intuition or any level of subjectivity to determine what a probability is. So um, an example of that would be um, a stock market um, analyst. Um, he says that he thinks that the likelihood of a stock, uh, a stock option going up is 70%. He's not basing it on anything, or I guess uh, in our case, we don't think he's basing it on any hard numbers. It's his level of expertise. It's his experience in the industry. It's what he's seen before. Um, but there's no like direct evidence to back that up. So, so it's an expert opinion, um, and that's that's three. That's subjective. Finding simple probabilities. We got into this a little bit in the last slide. Um, sample space is finite. All sample space outcomes are equally likely. Um, the probability of an event can be computed using the following formula, and that's just the number of sample space outcomes that correspond to an event. Uh, divided by the total number of sample space outcomes. So I guess we didn't get into that one on the last slide. Uh, we got into that one on a prior slide. Um, we got into that on this slide. So I said, what's the likelihood of rolling above a 4? So a 5 or a 6. And using this formula, the number of sample space outcomes that correspond to the event. So there's two sample space outcomes that correspond to the event over the total number of sample space outcomes of 6. Given that there's equally likely probability, you get one third or 0.3333333. This gets us into the elementary rules of probability. Um, so I guess I first preface by saying that uh, we're going to use this uh, Venn diagram or this type of diagram here to. Uh, to explain um, and I guess to show uh, the relationship between uh, different probabilities, okay? So this square, not the yellow square, but the blue square, represents total probability. That's always going to be equal to 1. And then the circle represents the probability of event A, okay? And then in this case, the area around it, uh, which we would call A complement, is the probability of A complement, which A complement is um, defined as 1 minus probability of A. So A complement is just saying not A. So we have an event that occurs right here, in this space and that's the probability or that's a that's the event a and this circle represents the area or the the amount of probability that it takes up the box around it is all of the total probability and so all of the space that is not within that circle is considered a complement or one minus the probability of a And like I said, we're going to run through lots of examples to reinforce these concepts. And that brings us to the next part, um, the union, intersection, and mutually exclusive. Um, again, looking at these boxes. So this box right here represents total probability of 1. And we'll go ahead and look at mutually exclusive first because I think it uh, highlights best. Mutually exclusive is... Um, when two events cannot occur at the same time. So one thing that we notice here is there is no overlap between um, the event A and the event B. They don't touch each other. They don't overlap in any way. So they're said to be mutually exclusive because that means that A and B cannot occur at the same time. So they operate within the same like probability space. There's you know there's one total probability for all of the sample space outcomes, but of the sample space outcomes, they're in all of those sample space outcomes, there's an A and B, and A and B can never occur at the same time. That's mutually exclusive. Okay? Um, the intersection of A and B is denoted by this area right here. When A and B cross over that, that middle portion, and that is when A and B occur at the same time specifically A and B. 
Okay, so intersection, you're going to hear this word a lot, and. Um, and this is written as A with this uh, little symbol here. I'm not even sure what that's called. But we would just pronounce it uh, A intersect B or A and B. Okay. And then uh, the union would just be refer to A or B. So that's the word for that. And this would be this right here. It, that symbol is just the opposite of the one up there. And this is uh, spoken A union B or A or B. And that's denoted by this picture right here. This is when for an event um, A can occur or B can occur. So or A and B can occur at the same time. So the occurrence of only A, the occurrence of only or of A and B, and the occurrence of only B. The addition rule. Okay, so there's two different addition rules, um, but they'll make they'll make some sense here. Um, so there's the addition rule for mutually exclusive, um, and so we would say the probability of A union B. So us adding together, um, or the pro the total probability between the two events of when something's mutually exclusive, uh, the probability of A union B is going to be the probability of A plus the probability of B. Seems simple enough. Um, and that's because these probabilities don't touch each other. So that's that. Now, if A and B are not mutually exclusive, then the formula switches a little bit, meaning they're not mutually exclusive, meaning there's overlap. Okay, we could see by this diagram that there's overlap here. So when we have, when we're looking at the addition rule for um, not mutually exclusive events, um, there's overlap, and then we have to minus off one of those overlaps. Think of this diagram right here, and kind of picture A and B, the circles A and B, moving together in order to overlap. So they move, they're moving, um, picture them like moving uh, toward each other, and then they overlap, and then they form this picture down here. When they form that bottom picture, notice that this portion, the, the A intersect B portion, there's actually one on top of the other. Okay, so when we are going to be looking at the, the union, when we are adding the union together, because we've put those two probabilities on top of each other, we've got to chop off one of the intersections. So that's what this term is. So this formula is the exact same thing as the top, except that we're chopping off one of the intersections. Because, like say, if we're looking at A, now we only have to account for this portion of B. Okay, so why don't you guys turn to your worksheet um, and number one, and we will go over some of these uh, problems. The following contingency table summarizes the number of students at a college who have a MasterCard or a Visa card. So remember I said contingency tables were going to creep up um, uh, later on in the semester. Now is the case. So, um, so here we go. So find the probability that a randomly selected student has a MasterCard. Okay, so if we want to know the probability of a randomly selected student having a MasterCard, um, we just need to look for the marginal probabilities. Okay, so this is a contingency table. The marginal probabilities are going to be just at the bottom here and on the side. Or I guess I shouldn't call them probabilities, they're frequencies. Um, so this is a frequency distribution. And then this is the overall total of students. Um, so if we wanted to know uh, the probability that a student has a MasterCard, okay, so that's, we're looking at A, we would write it as the probability of M, or the probability of MasterCard. And that's just going to be equal to the number of students who have a MasterCard over the number of students possible. So the number of students who have a MasterCard, we would look all the way over here, and it is uh, 2,500. 
see that? So regardless of whether they have a visa or not have a visa, we're just looking at the total. We're just looking at the marginal probability. So we see 2,500. So if we want to find a probability, we'd say 2,500 over 10,000, and that equals 0.25. And then, uh, likewise, we want to look at the probability of having a visa. And we look and we see that it's 4,000. So 4,000 is the total number of students who have a visa. And that's over 10,000 possible, so 0.4. And now uh, we get into... Um, probability that a student has both cards. So that would be the intersection, right? So now these inner pieces are intersection points. So um, now we want to look, so the probability of having both cards is, let us see here, so that's going to be the probability of M and V. And that's equal to uh, the number of students that have both, and we look up here in the contingency table, and it's, we see that the intersection of having a MasterCard and having a Visa uh, is 1,000. So, 0.10. And then, uh, has a MasterCard or a Visa card. Okay, so so that would be the probability of M or V. Sorry about my writing here; it is hard to write on this um, this uh, tablet. Um, so then we would find the probability that somebody has a Mastercard. Actually, we'll go back to our formula. So they, uh, the addition rule, and we know that these are not mutually exclusive events because we know that they overlap. And we know that they overlap because we know there's an intersection. So we saw in C that they intersected in some capacity, right? So there's, there's a thousand students that, that had, um, there's a thousand students that uh, had both cards. So we know that they're not mutually exclusive, so we know what formula to use. So that would be probability of M plus the probability of V plus the probability, or sorry, minus the probability of M and V. And we actually already calculated all those numbers. So 0.25 plus 0 0.40 minus 0.10 is equal to 0.65 minus 0.10 or 0.50. Okay. And oh, and then E has neither card. Uh, we would look up on the table where does not have a visa and does not have a MasterCard cross, and we can see that that's 4,500. So this would be does not have uh, either card, so neither card or neither card, the probability of not M and not V. And that's going to be equal to 4,500 over 10,000. Or 0.45. And then lastly, we're going to look at um, look at F here. Uh -oh. Let me get this in screen for you. And F is saying has exactly one of two credit cards. Um, so a couple different ways that you could do this, um, you could, you could, well, let's do it a couple different ways. So we'll say one minus the probability that they have both, and then also minus the probability that they have neither. And we have calculated both of those, right? So. 
0.10 from uh, part C and 0.45 from part E and that gives us point 0.45. Similarly, uh, we could look at the probability, we could look at the frequency table up here of having a MasterCard and not having a Visa and having a Visa and not having a MasterCard and then adding those two up. We would add up 3,000 plus 1,500 to get 4,500 and then take that all over 10,000 and then that would also give us 0.45 so that would be another way to do it. So that's us solving for elementary probability um, on the worksheet. Uh, let that soak in and we're going to start on uh, conditional probability um, in the next video. Thanks so much guys.